We welcome everyone. Good evening. It is a pleasure and a true mm -hmm. honor to introduce you to Nefertiti Matos. Nefertiti Matos is a fervent advocate for accessible culture, technology, and transit. She currently works as the Partnership Development Coordinator for DICAPTA, a provider of accessible media for people with sensory disabilities. Currently, Nefertiti combines his work as Dica at DICAPTA with her job as a freelance audio description narrator and voiceover artist. Since then, Nefertiti has been a constant point of reference for me, and maybe she doesn't know this, but it's the truth, uh -oh. in my teaching, <laughs> my research, and my audio description practice. Please join me in welcoming Nefertiti with the warmest round of applause. Aww, thank you so much. <laughs> Aww, wow, I'm very excited to be here. Thank you all so much for being here today, whether you're a student or somebody who's interested in audio description, want to learn more about it. I'll tell you that I am a first generation Dominican American. Um, so yeah, that's been, that's been interesting to navigate those waters, you know, the rugged individualism of America mixed with the very sort of clingy communal everything, you know, Dominicano, familia type of thing. <laughs> Um, and also being the only blind one, the only disabled one in my family. And here tonight with me is Scott Blanks. He is, wow, Scott, what are you? You are so many things to me. Uh, he is my, my best friend, my, the love of my life, uh, someone I admire very much professionally. And uh, my name is Scott Blanks. I actually live in California. I am the Vice President of Programs at the Lighthouse for the Blind in San Francisco. And I'm here not as an expert, but as a, a fan of audio description and an avid consumer of it. Uh, Nefertiti and I co-founded the Twitter audio description community. You'll hear a little bit more from me, but this is the Nefertiti Show. So back to you. <laughs> <laughs> my boss called me that recently. Okay, so let's dive into what we're here for this evening, right? Audio description is defined as the verbal depiction of key visual elements in media and live productions. Uh, so I can't see you, so can I hear you? Yes? Okay, is that clear for everybody? Okay, cool. So let's actually watch something now. This is from um, an audio description collective that I am a part of. We are called Social Audio Description. And here tonight, I want to show you um, a couple of scenes from the Scream trailer that we described. I want to warn you that this is pretty graphic. It is a horror uh, film. Uh, hopefully, people are not too sensitive. It's all fake, I promise. <laughs> um, and the first clip you're going to hear is me doing the real-time or inline audio description. And then we'll see the same scenes with expanded or extended description. The okay. clip, please. Sure. Hello, I'm Nefertiti. Today, I'm going to be describing the screen, screen trailer. trailer. I'll, I'll first do a standard real-time audio description, and then I'll do an expanded description. A girl alone in a suburban house at night. Unknown name. Amber texts her, You should answer it. How did you know my landline was ringing? Amber? This isn't Amber. This isn't funny, Amber. When do you like to play a game, Tara? Tara runs to the door with a knife. <laughs> Ghostface slashes her ribs and she slams the door. Doors unlocked. Her security app. All doors locked. <gasps> doors unlocked. She backs down the hallway. He grabs her from behind. He throws her down and she crawls away. He looks down on her with a bloody knife. And now, I will be going over it again with expanded description. The lights are on in a white suburban house at night. A silver cordless landline rings with the ID, unknown name. In the kitchen, Tara pushes reject on the cordless while holding her smartphone. She is a thin, light-skinned Latina teen with long, wavy dark hair pulled back in a ponytail. 
She's just texted. Mom's out of town again. You should come over here. Free dinner. Mini binge watch options. Amber responds. Have to do better. Unlock liquor cabinet. You should answer it. How did you know my landline was ringing? Amber? This isn't Amber. This isn't funny, Amber. Would you like to play a game, Tara? Tara runs to the front door and opens it. Ghostface is there with a combat knife. He slashes her left rib, cutting through her pink sweater. She slams the door on him and backs away, holding her wound. In her bloody hand, the security app shows the doors are unlocked. Deadbolts around the house twist. Doors unlocked. Holding the knife in her right hand, Tara taps her phone to lock the doors. All doors locked. Doors unlocked. She backs toward a wall. She holds the cordless phone to her ear. From the dark doorway, Ghostface grabs her from behind. He throws her on the kitchen floor. She struggles to crawl away. Ghostface slowly straightens his back and looks down on her holding the bloody knife. As she reaches for the curtained French doors, Ghostface so drags her back. The is the inline or real-time audio description, which is when you write what you can and you say what you can within the spaces allotted. So there isn't always a lot of space for us to put everything we need to put in, um, in those spaces. But that's inline and real-time audio description. Inline description is most often preferred because most media developers, you know, filmmakers and the like are not crazy about having two versions of their content. That second scene was what, about a minute and a half longer than the inline first scene? What was that? I wish I could say I'm surprised. As a blind person, I'm not. You're a blind person? Yeah, hi. Oh, what's your name? Anexus. Anexus. Oh, nice to meet you, Dominicana. Okay, <laughs> I think we, <laughs> we share the same last name. ¿Verdad? Te llamas Matos. Tu apellido? Si. All right, nice to meet you. Saying, like, I wish I could say I'm surprised, but like, I, I can get shocked, but then like five minutes later, I'm like, oh, wait. Uh-huh. We're living here. I'm no longer anymore. Yes, yes, <laughs> you get it. That's exactly right. Like, there's just to get all the information that we need. I mean, listen to that. We miss out that she's a Latina teen. We don't know that she's wearing a pink sweater. All that stuff though, possible with expanded description. Mm -hmm. Did anyone notice something very interesting during the text message exchange? What was it? A synthetic voice came in. Oh. We used a fake AI voice to have that represent how we typically use our technology. We have screen readers on our phones, on our computers. Right now I'm listening to my screen reader to help me stay on track with my notes. You know, moments like that, it's okay to use. It's a very robotic, listen to this. See, that's a very robotic, very non-emotional type of voice. We do that day in and day out. Like I said, my iPhone has a voice. My computer has a voice. Uh, you know, if I was of a certain type of need, my microwave would have a voice. My washing machine would have a voice. Um, so about human narration versus synthetic or computer generated voices. There's a lot of controversy around this subject. And really it comes down to quantity versus quality. Part of it is that human narration costs more, but also some people believe that we can't possibly describe everything. There's just too much in our back catalog and there's too much being produced every day to keep up with the demand of description. So they think that the solution is to go with something that is of lesser quality, that ensures that there is at least some type of description. The word grateful comes to mind when I talk about this. We should be grateful that we have something, anything, even if it's crappy, is better than nothing at all. I do not agree with that. Yeah, the, yeah. basically where you're seeing it happen a lot right now is synthetic voices being used with dramatic or comedic or basically entertainment content which feels like the most inappropriate place for it to be used. 
where that content was made by and with humans, uh, we don't want that synthetic voice to take us out of the moment of whatever that experience is meant to convey. Um, just to give an example, the, the vast majority right now of the synthetic speech that's being used is being provided by Amazon Prime Video. They're doing a lot of back catalog titles that aren't otherwise being described, but the quality of the voice and also the quality of other parts of the process that Nefertiti will talk about are not very good. No, there's a lot of mispronounced names. It's like quality control itself needs quality control. You know, th think about the scene we just watched, right? If I had been there and be like, Ghostface slashes her in her pink sweater now, she screams, oh, she's pulling at the curtain. Okay, like, no, 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 that's not, that's not what we want. And I still sounded too human just now doing that compared to these voices that we hear. But okay, yeah, let's get back to the human component of all of this. Um, I'll talk to you now about what it takes to be a professional. The audio description process is typically broken down into four parts. There's the writing, there's the quality control, narrating, and editing or engineering. A lot of this is on you. You really do get out of this however much you put into it. And so what do I mean by that? I mean that there's a lot of learning that needs to be done personally. I had to teach myself how to use multiple digital, uh, excuse me, digital audio workstations, we call those DOS, um, to render my narrations into different files depending on what the demands of the project are. That's something else. And, you know, also the use of my, my Braille display. You want to show my Braille display? Pass that around, Scott. Yeah. He'll connect via Bluetooth via his phone so that you can actually see the Braille happening in, in real life. I think Anexus may maybe the only one who reads it, so let's keep it, you know, whatever you. <laughs> if you see something juicy, Anexus, uh, don't, you know, keep it to, your, keep it to us. Uh, this is a Focus 40. Actually, I'm going to pass around. Both of these machines are like crazy expensive, you guys. We're talking five, six thousand dollars a piece. Yeah. Uh huh. So not everybody can afford it. That's a whole other class we could have on the the inaccessibility of accessible technology for people. You know, that's important too. Also, software, right? Like I use Reaper um, and Audacity, making sure that I have the latest versions. There's uh, payments that go into that. If my braille display has a problem, uh, that could be pretty costly to fix or to have to get a new one. So there are a lot of cost concerns that go along with this. I, as a blind person, might have some different ones to a sighted person. You know, a sighted person can get on any computer, click any mouse, bring up any document, and boom, you're good to go. Whereas someone like me, if my braille display goes to heck, um, and or my computer decides to not work, that's a lot of money that has to come out of my pocket. But it is so, so much fun. Uh, switching into this career is the best decision I've made. Okay, let's talk about the writing of a script. This is the first step of audio description. I have been known to write the every now and again audio description script. And uh, if that blows your mind, that's okay. A lot of people have a hard time wrapping their mind around how a blind person can actually write visual stuff. Um, for example, when it was made public that I was the writer, I was chosen to be the writer for um, a documentary about George Floyd called Say His Name, it definitely got people talking, not just because George Floyd is such a hot topic, but because a blind person was going to be describing this, what? So it, it, was, it was hard from sighted people, which I expected, but also from blind people who sadly fall into this trap of, I can't, I can't, I can't. And then you have folks like me, and I'm not the only one, who say, yes, yes I can, because I enjoy writing, and I'm good at it, and I'm good at being a blind person too, so why not me, right? Why not me? How does a blind person write audio description? I'll tell you that in brief, when possible, I hire a sighted assistant who can impartially convey key visual events. And let me be clear, this person is not dictating to me. I don't just type word for word what they tell me. They simply tell me what they see, and through some clarifying questions from me to them, 
and keeping in mind the time constraints that exist during audio description, right? We just talked about inline and real-time audio description. Sometimes you have like a second or two to say something. Other times, if we're lucky, we have, I don't know, anything from 10 to 30 seconds to really, really describe a scene. Um, but we're always dealing with time constraints. Some blind writers are like me. They go the sighted assistant route while others make use of visual interpreter services like IRA, that's A-I-R-A. And IRA, in brief, connects users, um, connects users via a video call to a professional who help complete the blind person uh, by doing visual tasks. So anything from reading their mail to getting on a website and helping them click through things because the website's inaccessible, to describing visual elements. OK, we're moving on. Let's talk about quality control. These are the specialists who come in once the script is written to make sure that it makes sense to the viewer. There's a lot of advocates for disability inclusion in this space. And one of our philosophies, and you may have heard of this already, nothing about us without us. Mm -hmm. If you haven't, please remember that. If you go into blindness space or any type of disability space or any space really, whether it be racial, gender, anything, don't do anything without input from the people who you are catering to, please. Okay, think about it. Nobody else knows more about what makes sense to us than us. Just because you can write doesn't mean that your writing is a good match for the content. Right? Just because you see there's a television here somewhere doesn't mean like that's the only information you can convey or should be conveying. Also hugely important is the ability and willingness to keep up with the times because they're always changing. Believe it or not, we blind people are of this world too. We care very much about all aspects of the human condition, including skin color, gender identity, disability representation, costume and set design, and yeah, even more mature content like sex scenes. <laughs> we want to know that stuff. So you have your script written and it's been QC'd and it's been narrated, right? It's been recorded. Now comes the editing, which is done by an audio engineer. This person or team's responsibility is to place the narration so that audio levels are consistent and the track is inserted in such a way so as not to step on dialogue. You never want to speak over somebody else who is speaking when you're describing, right? There's certain type of music that you might get away with speaking over. There you go. It's, it's basically four parts. You write it, you quality control it, you narrate it, and then you place it. You want it all to be level and you want it to make sense. Even if it's a human voice, you know, you're here listening that Sarah has this gorgeous red dress, and then you hear, you know, uh, but a lion is about to bite her face off, and there isn't even a lion in the scene, right? Like, if, I mean, that's a really extreme example, but the point I'm trying to make is that uh, when it comes to placing, it's a very precise process to get just the right recording, sounding level flesh up against the content and have that actually making sense. So let's talk a little bit about cultural competence. Um, I, I would argue that I'm already talking about it actually. When I talk about blind people being part of the creation process that was made for blind people by blind people, that's cultural competence. When you have a Latina, QCing, writing, narrating a film or a show about Latinos, or, you know, hablando español porque la persona habla español, right? A Latino, that's cultural competency because they know the difference between natural hair, say, or micro braids, you know? It's not some random person who isn't of the culture saying these things while not, you know, checking in with, with people who are in this space, making sure that they're getting it right. It's a whole cohesive, holistic experience when audio description is done right. It's not always done right. But when it is, oh my goodness, it is life-changing. 
So, an example of what isn't cultural competency. When you have a movie like Black Panther, everybody aware of Black Panther? Yes, yes super like social phenomenon, right? Yes. All black cast, amazing. Well, for me and for everyone else who went to the theater to watch Black Panther, it was described by a white British man. Bizarre, right? <laughs> Talk about distracting you right out of the experience. As my friend and podcast host Thomas Reed said, when I went to see Black Panther and realized that it was narrated by a British white dude, it was like having a story of black pride told by the damn colonizer. Right? I mean, think about it. It's, it, it, it's, it's not okay. This is not okay. You guys want to see an example of audio description that just came out that's like yes. blind people are all a Twitter about it. Literally, Twitter is like blowing up about this. Yes. Yeah? Okay. Okay, yeah, let's do it Perfect. then. This commercial was designed with audio description for people who are blind or partially sighted. So, so more people can experience it. A red-haired woman holds a white cane and feels her way down apartment steps. She strolls past a man scrubbing his vintage sports car. Love the music, Rick. Good morning, Marjorie. Good morning. Marjorie tilts her head. What's that sound? A shopping cart? Hey, Marjorie. It's her friend on a skateboard. Hey, Marcus. Nearby, kids play soccer. Marjorie steps into a tiny cafe. Hey, Marjorie. Hi, Mayoki. Vanilla latte, please. Okay, 450. Someone shuffles impatiently behind her. Marjorie isn't flustered. Her cards used to feel the same, but touch cards from MasterCard have distinct notches for debit, credit, and prepaid. She feels a half hexagon, her credit card. She taps a terminal and takes her latte. Thank you. She steps outside and strides away from us. Touch cards appear, each with a distinct notch. Introducing TouchCard by MasterCard, because a world designed for all of us is priceless. The word priceless comes up next to the MasterCard logo. This is an out and out big company taking an interest in a, a different type of customer base. I mean, we blind people, we've, we've been using credit cards forever. We use American cur uh, currency, but uh, have you noticed that all of our money is shaped the same? It smells the same, it sounds the same. Really, a bill to me is like any other bill, right? I mean, there are technological ways to do this. There are apps on our phones that we can use to identify currency and the like. So that's great, but can anybody identify some of the problems here? Did you notice that was inline description? The commercial is created, was created quite mindfully with audio description in mind from the get. We blind people are missing a lot. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of interesting things about this one. The, the filmmaking is interesting because there's a lot of um, darkness and a lot of people are thinking, is this darkness representing blindness? Or is it possibly that the darkness is representing silence? Because as a blind person, uh, Nefertiti and I are the same in that we've, we've been blind our whole lives, essentially. And so darkness actually doesn't really have a visual representation to me. We don't know something is there until we hear it. Right. And that's, that is kind of an interesting way that this commercial was, was representing things. The audio description narrator, or the person who wrote the script, didn't communicate that. So that is an interesting element to right. think about. And no, you know, we don't know. We uh, don't know that, unless a sighted person, which they did, <coughs> excuse me, came in and provided a more expanded written description, letting us know, hey, you know, it's interesting how these filmmakers decided to use light and darkness and sort of literally shed light for us on how this commercial was shot. No, we don't walk around in like pitch blackness. People who are congenitally blind, who were born blind, how would they know what blackness is, darkness is, if they've never seen, right? But still, I do not walk around in a, in a world of darkness. I can see shadow. I can see shapes. You know, I can see light. So to think that blindness is just this pitch black, oh my God, my world is over, that's, that's not the way it is at all.
you know? So it's a whole spectrum that we're dealing with here. Um, but going back to what we're, what we're talking about here, which is the audio description, is that this commercial, as well-meaning as it is, and as cool as it is, that audio description is, is being talked about and thought about and put out into the mainstream. Again, not as a second uh, option, not as an afterthought, built in, baked in. Uh, it, it still is problematic just because you can't possibly fit everything in to inline audio description the way you could expanded description. Some, some people, actually, let me ask you this. Can anybody think of another way that isn't extending the video by adding expanded description? Can anybody think of any other way that we could supplement? Abigail? Abigail? Um, by making more space from the very beginning when the film is being created. Yes, that is the ideal. That again, most of the people using captions, believe it or not, are hearing people. I can't see a movie without captions. Thank you. And you hear perfectly fine, don't you? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. That's exactly my point. Audio description is not there yet. You look up audio description online, and the first thing you see is, how do I turn this damn thing off? Why is my TV talking at me? Who is this woman saying all this extra crap? I mean, this, this is what you see online for people. But we're trying to change it. Slowly but surely, it's becoming you know, more known, more talked about, and more accepted. A commercial like this, for all its criticisms that it has, helps towards that, right? It helps educate people like, first of all, wow, blind people can see TV, that's cool. Oh, and this is how they do it? That's even cooler. Mm -hmm. So that's exciting. But another way that you can supplement audio description is by providing written transcripts. For example, um, yeah, let's keep with this commercial. If this commercial had a written transcript somewhere, maybe even by the, the you know, input by the filmmaker or what have you, I bet they would talk about their use of light and darkness and what they meant by it. This is almost borderline, borderline offensive. There was a section there where the girl, they're like, what is that, a shopping cart? And then it turns out that it's a, a guy on a, on a skateboard, right? And it's like, I don't know. I've been blind for a long time. Scott has been blind for a long time. We can tell the difference between what a shopping cart sounds like, what a skateboard sounds like, you know, what a, I don't know, a baby carriage going down the street sounds like. We can tell those differences. In our world, unless we hear it or smell it or feel it, it doesn't really exist. Like I could have walked in this room and you all guys would have been absolutely quiet. I would have sensed that this is a full room. You think you would have sensed, Scott? Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. So we would sense there's something going on here. This is not an empty room. Mm -hmm. But unless we hear, you know, we heard you all talking like we did when we came in, we have no idea that there's a lot of you. <sighs> so that is an Nefertiti original. The nothing about us without us is not. That is a very tried and true, <clears throat> excuse me, philosophy that disability advocates live by. It is our mantra, it is something we live, we breathe, and we'll shove down the throats and slap in the faces of anybody, you know, who's in this space, clearly not including, again, the people that you're trying to cater to. Oh man, it is such, a, it's such an important aspect and component of disability equality and inclusion. Just equity in general, again, it applies to any population really. How, do, how much do you want to bet that even though they are using a blind person in this commercial, who, by the way, her name is Marilee Tuffington. She's, uh, she's the head of an acting academy. She does great work, but she is one of these people who is borderline legally blind. The problem is that I wonder how many people in the QC process were actually blind. Because I guarantee you, if there have been blind people, they would have asked these questions about, why are you using light and, sh and darkness like this? Why are you asking, oh, is that a shopping cart? Oh, no, it's a dude on a skateboard. Like, we don't, that's not our world. So a lot of the criticism that's coming out of this commercial is exactly that. Were blind people consulted when this script was written? I'm not so sure that we were part of the quality control process because of how this was handled. All the time, right now I have, I think, three people asking me over Messenger, over Twitter, asking me, how do you do this, how do you do that? 
And I try my best to let them know my process while always saying that everyone is different. What has worked for me does not necessarily work for them or may not work for them, but that that's okay. Like with anything, right? We all have to find our way in this life and what works for us. Not literally gotten hurt, but sometimes my emotions have been hurt or other people. What is it if they don't hear, they feel, right? So if you don't hear me talking to you, I may have to do something that'll make you feel some sort of way so that you start paying attention to me. So I've had to do that and that's a tough thing to do, but luckily for me, you know, it's, it's resulted in a, in a positive, in, in positive ways. And if it hasn't, guess what? I, I don't really want to work with those people. I, I love it when blind people want to enter into this space um, and I encourage them. It is absolutely possible. One of those things where you hear, well, if I can, you can too. This is like any other profession. It's a lot of fun, but I have to be on my game. I have to keep competitive, you know? I have to do what I need to do, whether that's, you know, take a class or attend a seminar, um, you know, get voice coaching lessons, whatever I have to do to keep myself marketable and keep myself out there so that content creators, and directors and such pick me, look past the blindness. Some of them even look at the blindness as an asset. You know, that's all on me. And that's all on you or Joe Schmo or whoever wants to get in this. Like, it's, it's, it's all up to us. But again, by a blind person for blind people, and yet who are the, gate pe like the gatekeepers? Sighted people. Why, why is that the case? It should not be the case. I'm not saying, you know, down with sighted people. I have to live with y'all. It's fine. <laughs> you know, like, but you know, like, um, that's not what I'm saying at all, but I am saying that there is room in this space for people like me. There has to be room in this, in this field for people like me. It cannot be the, from the top down, you know, sighted people helping pobrecita blind people. No. <laughs> No, we help ourselves. And again, no one knows better than we do about us. So, okay, what time is it? Wow, I, I need to uh -huh. go. <laughs> 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 <laughs>